Hi everyone, thanks for coming out tonight. My name is Erin Page, I'm the Programming Librarian here at New Canaan Library. Welcome to Authors on Stage. Tonight we have a really unique Authors on Stage program in which we have a moderated discussion. So you have two authors on stage for the price of one. This is exciting. So we have Kevin Morris tonight presenting his new book, White Man's Problems, and local celebrity, James Fry, here to ask him some questions and moderate the discussion. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here tonight. The library is really committed to putting on fabulous programs like this. So if you like what you see, I hope you'll consider a contribution. We have a donation box in the back and your change is much appreciated. And as programming librarian, I promise to be a good steward of your money and bring you good things like this as much as possible. Thanks so much and enjoy. Uh, thanks for the intro. Thanks for coming. Uh, I do live in New Canaan. I love New Canaan. I love this library. Um, if you happen to live in town, you should take advantage of it and use it. It's a, it's a great place for books and for people and for reading and just a great local cultural institution. Um, I'm here tonight with Kevin Morris, who wrote an awesome book called White Man's Problems. Um, Kevin and I have, a, have an interesting history. Um, we've known each other for, I think, about 20 years. Um, I met Kevin when I was a 24 or 25-year-old screenwriter in Los Angeles who needed a lawyer um, and a agent recommended I go see these guys who had a small law firm in Santa Monica that he thought I would think they were cool and we would get along. And so I zoomed out to Santa Monica. I lived in Laurel Canyon at the time in Los Angeles. And I met Kevin and I met his partners and they were cool guys. They didn't seem like lawyers. Um, my dad was a fucking lawyer. Um, and my dad was not like him. And uh, Kevin and a couple guys he works with have been my attorneys ever since. Um, whatever I have ever done in my life, be it make a movie or write a book or make a TV show or a video game or whatever, um, they do all the deals and they protect me. And um, so I know Kevin through that way, but more than a lawyer, the, the great part about meeting him was he was a lawyer who was also my friend who was a guy I would play golf with or go out to dinner with or have a drink with or call when I had a problem that had nothing to do with the law. Um, you know, a friendship in the truest, most regular sense. Um, and so while he's a great lawyer, I always say he's a better human being. And I've had an odd career where I've had some very, very highs, very, very high highs and some very, very low lows. And Kevin and his partners have been with me through all of it. And for that, I'm uh, deeply appreciative and grateful and lucky. Um, we're not here to talk to him about, about, about his life as a lawyer. We're here to talk to him about his life as a writer. And aside from being a great lawyer, Kevin's a great writer. Um, I remember a few years ago when he first started showing me some of the work that became this book, and I was kind of stunned. Like, I knew he was a smart guy. I knew he was a guy who loved books and read a ton of books and could speak intelligently about books. Um, but it's one of those things there uh, I never expected him to write a book um, that's not just a book, but is a great book and an awesome book and a book that I read. And I was like, damn, I wish I wrote that. Um, and for me, that's always the measure of anything I read. If I wish I could write it, or I am intimidated by it. And it, it sounds pompous or whatever, but it doesn't happen that often. Um, so Kevin, tell us about your, your sort of journey from law to writing to this book and then the future. Okay. Does this work? Oh, am, I, am I projecting now? Is that better? 
Okay. Um, well, thanks, man. And thank you all for being here. Thanks to the library. And, uh, you know, I, we owe a lot to James, my, my partners and I, and he's, uh, he tells the story very graciously, but he's, uh, he's been consist consistent, even since we were younger, he was consistently unique, original, tough, um, and talented, really, really, really talented, and in so many things. Um, and, uh, you know, we're just really, we're just really lucky. And, uh, you know, uh, our friend and partner, my partner, David Krinsman, um, and, and Jaime have been able to do a lot of, a lot of things. And it's been, it's been, it's been really fun. And th this is really, and James has helped me tremendously because he's one of the first people I had the, um, you know, I, I got the courage up to show my stuff to, and, uh, he was incredibly, Supportive, like incredibly supportive. Like read it in two days, and I had a novel that that I that I didn't get published that I sent to him, and he read it in two days and gave me great feedback. And like that, you know, um, that's wind in your sails when somebody as good as James uh, says something encouraging, and you, and you can tell they mean it. And then, uh, you know, I uh, uh, I dallied around with the, well, dally, you know, I tried to get the novel published for a couple, of, about six years ago, I decided, I've been a lawyer for 20-some-odd um, years, and um, and we've been very fortunate, and my partners and I had, have had a lot of success, but I, I really, um, down deep, considered myself, um, consider myself a writer and wanted to be a writer, like a lot of, like a lot of people, I think, and um, I... Yeah, you know, I was, I was, uh, I, I, I was, uh, you know, I was an English and government major at college, and I, uh, you know, I, and I wrote all the time. I wrote since I was a, wrote since I was a little kid, and, uh, and kind of had, kind of had this sort of fork in the road at the end of college, and, uh, and I didn't ha really know how to go about being a writer, and it seemed kind of irresponsible not to go and make the money that a lawyer could make, had to make a living and stuff like that. And so, um, what were you reading like in college or as a kid? Oh, I mean, I think I, I always, always, always read since I was a little kid and, 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 you know, and like, like a lot of kids, I would read something and I go, that's above your grade level. And, you know, then I kind of got a kick out of that. So I would always try to read above my grade level. You know, I, I, uh, um, I, you know, I remember, reading Sophie's Choice when I was a really little kid and, you know, and, and like, uh, lots of sports stuff, you know, like lots and lots and lots of sports stuff, um, um, even from a very young age. And I, I think there's lots of great, especially then, there's lots of great sports, there's a lot of great sports writing now, but, um, and then, and then... Like Frederick Axley sports stuff? Yeah, that, that came later, that came later. Like Furman Bisher, Strange but True Sports Stories, stuff like that, stuff like, <laughs> stuff, stuff like that when I was really little. But then, you know, I read a lot of Shakespeare in high school and, uh, and Kurt Vonnegut and stuff like that started to, to turn me on. And, I, you know, I would say in high school I started really falling in love with sort of American writing and put sort of, sort of uh, 20th century American writing. And then in college, you know, I, I took a lot of English major stuff and did the, you know, I, from, you know, we had a, co where I went to college, the, the guy that wrote the Norton Anthology of English Literature was the professor of, you know, English 101, and so he took us all the way through from, from, you know, from Homer all, all the way to the present. I really liked uh, modern American poetry when I was in, uh, like, um, like I love Yeats. I'm sorry, he's not American, but uh, sorry, modern per modern poetry of the 20th century. You know, I I uh, I really love Yeats. I really like, um, uh, you know, I got into the Beats like a lot of people. Um, you know, I really like William Carlos Williams. I thought it was super cool. Edna Saint Vincent Millay. Um, um, uh, not so much. You know, I liked. Um, the guy that was the insurance guy, um, he might have lived, lived in Connecticut, I think. Wallace Stevens. Wallace Stevens yeah. Um, I always thought it was fascinating. He was a little above my head. I like I, I like John Ashbery then, and I like him more and more the older I get. I think John Ashbery is a really cool writer. Um, and then and then you know and then I started, you know, and then in college I fell deep for James Joyce and um, Dubliners and the Portrait of the Artist and and uh, you know. Um, 
and then you know really started my uh, journey with a lot of you know and I and I did the 19th century American writers and and but really sort of uh, began my I think that's when my focus and sort of love of 20th century American writers started. And then law the whole time were you thinking uh, I really want to be a writer? Or well, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, I wrote, I wrote, I wrote a lot of stuff in college. Took a lot. I had really some really great creative writing teachers. Actually, the poet Archie Ammons. I don't know if anybody knows of him. A. A. Ammons. He was my. He was a. He taught undergrad um, creative writing at Cornell, and so did. Uh, Tama Janowitz's mother, Phyllis, who was a great lady, and uh, and had some real great creative writing stuff, and um, and like really great, really great analysis and criticism courses as well. Um, so I think it taught me to be a reader as much as a writer. But you know, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't the world's most in tune student. So, uh, but I managed to get some grades and I tested well. So, law school was an opportunity and. You know, uh, I didn't. I didn't know how to go about being a writer. Probably didn't have the courage to do it. And law school was was right there. And I decided to get it over with. And then once you get into law school, you kind of feel like you got to be a lawyer. And um, and then you know, but I always sort of felt like I was walking the plank. Um, so to avoid being a real lawyer, I made it out to Los Angeles. And I think I had this sort of artist thing inside. And you know, a lot, uh, this is heavy. You know, like a lot of you know, a lot of internal, like, trip going on, but, um... I know, like, as not a lawyer, when I had to go looking for lawyers, it was like, you go meet a bunch of guys, and a lot of the guys have suits, and it was like, remember a, a Melbourne and Myers, if you know that law firm, it's a big L.A. firm, so I went and met a guy there, um, met a couple guys in the Central City, and then, yeah, we went out to, to see you guys, and it was, it was like, so I, yeah, I started at a big. I started at a. I started at a. I started at a big. I started at a big firm, and can you hear us without? Yeah, 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 yeah. I started at a big firm, and I kind of flung. You know, I have my own. Uh, uh, I'm, no, this works. Okay. <laughs> I basically flunked out of the big firm world and, um, you know, wanted to do what I ended up doing but didn't know how to go about it. So there was a very cool, I lived in Venice, there was a very cool Venice uh, undergrounds kind of film community going. It was pre-Sundance and I sort of fell in with this sort of, this is a group of guys that made uh, Sid and Nancy and Tapeheads and Repo Man. I don't know if anybody remembers those films, but real cool. Real cool, great stuff. So it was like Alex Cox and Peter McCarthy and these these guys, and nobody was a lawyer, so they needed a lawyer. So they're like, "Okay, kid, you can be our lawyer." And so um, that's how I got started. And then, and then what I noticed is that uh, in the law firms, the, the entertainment law firm racket is kind of a racket, and it was kind of dominated by three or four small firms um, uh, with uh, older gentlemen at the top, kind of raking in all the dough. And so I figured that. No one was really, I talked to my friends about who their lawyers were and they said, I don't know that guy, you know, he just takes 5% of my money or whatever. So I thought there was an opportunity there and there was, you know, there was because, uh, you know, we weren't that good, you know, people, there was a real need, like people, people uh, our age, you know, we, it, there, was a, there was an opening to, to, to do that. So, so career-wise things got great and then I ran into some incredibly talented people when I was younger and from that, you know, my interest, in, my interest in the law was not very high, but it skyrocketed when my own pecuniary gain became involved, you know. Um, I, mean, I got real interested uh, in it. And then motion picture and television law is, very, is, is interesting and fun. It's very business-like, and it's not something you learn in law school. It's a lot of, uh, you know, and, and then my, my particular thing was that I got to, I, you know, I, my, my partners and I, I quickly sort of joined together with a bunch of partners once we had some success. And, but the thing was, we got to uh, protect and defend and advocate for artists. And so my, my point is, I think I kind of found that and fell into that because of my desire, my, my creative personality or, or, or what have you. And so the great blessing I've had is, is, is in my practice, you know, in this strategy. Sort of st I, I think some people are ultra creative and will end up being, you know, creative in, you know, 
massive ways all the time, just have creative personalities. And I believe there's other people that have you know, straight business personalities and don't ever think about doing a creative thing. But I think a lot of the rest of us live in the middle. You know, and a lot of the rest of us straddle, straddle the world, and a lot of us sometimes have lives of desperation sometimes in that straddle. Um, and a lot of that, a lot of our creative stuff, especially for word people and, and reading people, is, you know, is devoted to reading and maybe not the craft of writing, and that's certainly the category I fell into. But at least in my straddle existence, I got to work with, you know, uh, even though I wasn't writing creatively the way I wanted to. I wrote some business stuff and I always kind of kept my pen warm, but um, even though I wasn't writing fiction like I wanted to, I was, you know, I was involved in a lot of really interesting sort of great creative, uh, it was a great creative time period and, you know, was, was involved in, you know, my clients are so the guys that created South Park and they don't have any other representatives, so I was involved in all the issues and all the creation of that. We had this guy, I represent, you know, I represent a lot of people who were on rocket ships and then my partners, um, but we grew a firm and we got in the middle of a lot of stuff and so there was a real creative aspect to building that business and being around a lot of, we were around a lot of great stuff. That's, that's and I remember when I was young, I was 24, 25, 26, the firm would have these parties and all the clients would go, they would have an annual golf tournament. It was like one of the big events of the year. So we would all go to this golf tournament and it was a bunch of unknown people. So Matthew McConaughey, uh, the guys who went on to make South Park, um, a whole group of us who knew each other from a young age only because of Kevin and his partners and all hung out together and all had these big crazy dreams and none of us knew what the fuck to do. You know, we had dreams, we had ideas and none of us had a business bone in our body. And you know, Kevin's underselling it a little bit when he says he sort of straddles the business and the creative. Um, as a creative person who's made his living since I was 24 as a creative person, you can't do it without help. Um, you need somebody not only to, you know, negotiate your contract, but to explain it to you. Um, and you need somebody, when you have a crazy idea, you can call up and say, can we do this? And, and, and one of the great things about Kevin and his partners was you would come up with this crazy ass shit. Can I do this? You'd be like, yeah, yeah, we'll figure it out. And, and I think back of, on my own creative life and I gotta say like those times before I really made it, before I had, had anything produced, I, I was making a living but before I had anything produced or I'd ever had a book published or anybody had ever heard of me, those were the best times. It was fun, there was no pressure, there was a world of possibility ahead of us, and I think that was the really exciting part. We all, the South Park guys didn't, but the rest of us had agents or lawyers, or agents or managers or whatever, but these guys were very much, and still are very much, our primary people. I talked to Kevin, and you mentioned his partner, David, far more, I talk to David every day, and it's not just like, hey, when's the check coming? Um, can I do this? How do I do this? Will you help me do this? Strategy. Who do we talk to about it? And, and even like, will you read it? Will you tell me if it's any good or not? Am I going to be able to sell it? Um, yeah, we, I don't know how you think about that time, but I think about those five, I, six, seven years, it's like, it's so fucking awesome. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I think about, I also think what happened, you know, what happened to, to you and your story is a, is a big touchstone for us as a firm because, you know, you know, we saw you go through, and we went through it with you, more fire than, than, than anybody. And, you know, one of the great things about being around that very, very uh, sort of fertile time um, in the late 80s, early 90s, is uh, a lot of rocket ships took off. And I think it coincided with the expansion of cable television and it coincided with Sundance and, and independent film and all that stuff. So we were kind of at ground zero. Um, but I think the thing, the, the, I, I guess to, you know, to continue with my own personal theme of creativity, um, one of the things about starting our own firm and being our own sort of uh, renegade lawyers or whatever is that we could do things you know, we produce things and we help finance things. Like I, I didn't, when I first started out, um, I had somebody, you know, Matthew McConaughey's college roommate 
became my assistant because I didn't have an assistant. And this guy was a filmmaker from NYU, and they, their hometown was uh, Longview, Texas. And uh, these guys were big into video because video was the sort of very vogue thing in film school at the time. And I didn't have anything to do, so we would go out and drink and talk about film projects. And Rob, uh, in their hometown in Longview, Texas, there was a, con this is a little hard to explain, but anybody ever see Hands on a Hard Body, the documentary? Yeah, so anyway, we, we went down and uh, there's a hands on a hard body. There was a hands on a hard body contest in Longview, Texas, and what that meant is the hard body was a hard body truck or a hard body Toyota truck, and these people would go down and you know they'd pick 20 people and they get hats and t-shirts and gloves and the whistle would blow on Monday morning, Friday morning before Labor Day, and they'd put a hand on the truck, and then the contest was whoever was the last person standing with their hand on the truck won the truck, and so we were just like holy shit, that, that is just too good. We got to go shoot that. So five of us, you know, we were young and crazy. So like, you know, I had like, I had, remember, I had $26,000 in the bank. So I put it in, you know, I, whatever. We bought, went out and got $18,000 worth of mics and cameras. And we went down and five of us and we shot this thing. And if you haven't seen the movie, go home tonight <laughs> and Google it and either download it from iTunes or watch it on Netflix. It's one of the greatest documentaries ever made. So my, the, the great thing is my, my, you know, so I was a producer and my friend Rob Bindler was the producer, filmmaker, and Rob was from the home, from that town. And what happened is, you know, to make a long story short or shorter, um, we, we had this sort of, we had this ironic kind of, and this was a, this is a great theme from, for my life. I, 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 I like to think or I like to shoot for. We had this sort of ironic, smart ass, cynical, bi-coastal view of what these, dumbasses were doing in this town in Texas. And we went down and shot it with that kind of attitude. But what happened is we fell in love. And if you, you know, hopefully you'll see the arc if you see the movie. But we fell in love with the contestants. And, you know, uh, the, the, the movie, you know, it took a couple of years to, to make. And it was a lot of hard, hard work. And it's a very hand-stitched documentary. But it, it holds up. But I guess the point of that is that we were able to do and ready to take the risks to do lots of crazy stuff. And um, the business is actually on the representative side and on the lawyer side. It's a pretty conservative thing, you know. It's a, it's a it's just sort of crank out like any law firm to crank like these traditional law firms just sort of crank out contracts and take a piece of what people make. And we found that we found that bringing extra stuff to the game um, helped us a lot. And personally, I always wanted to stay involved with with creative stuff. And I think that's in a lot of ways because I wanted to do creative things and kind of had this old horrible, <laughs> you know, <laughs> continual fear of dying behind my desk as a lawyer. So, yeah. so, so when did you start the book? So around six years ago, I mean, I've been writing, I started writing pretty heavily around <coughs> six years ago. I had a um, professor at Cornell who I stayed in good touch with and I wrote a couple op-ed pieces around the time of the writer's strike six or seven years ago. And it was really fun, and I wrote. I was really against the strike, even though I represented a lot of writers. I was really worried about the strike, and I had a couple. I, I had an op-ed published in the Wall Street Journal. I had an op-ed published in the Los Angeles Times, trying to, you know, suggest ways to avoid the strike. And then I, I wrote a, another piece, uh, and uh, I don't know she, she she wouldn't. I don't think she would mind me saying this, but uh, I wrote another piece, and everybody was putting stuff up on the Huffington Post, so I sent. Uh, I sent it to somebody who knew Ariana Huffington, and they sent it to Ariana, and like I got an email. This is wonderful, darling. Put it up, you know. And like, <laughs> I put it up, and I had stuff on the Huffington Post, and and then I had like a little blog on the Huffington Post, and my friend Glenn Altshuler from Cornell, who's sort of like my, who's my college advisor, and then he became my friend, but he's always my college advisor, and always like giving me, you know, it's like a pain in the ass always. But he's a good writing, a good writing, uh, you know, the great, the best kind of pain in the ass. He, when I started writing, he was a great, uh, you know. He'd always make me do the first draft and stuff like that. So we started writing together, and his big idea was let's do book reviews for the Huffington Post. And I was like, get the fuck, you know, like book reviews for the Huffington Post. Forget it. That's the stupidest idea I ever heard. But he talked me into it, and we started uh, once a month doing book reviews on the Huffington Post, which I don't think anybody ever read, but it was good discipline. And around the same time, I so I said, all right, I got to do this, and I and I bought that place in Santa. So I I, I got a I, I bought a small apartment in Santa Monica where I you know, dedicated, where I said I'm just going two days a week, at least two days a week, and hopefully three days a week there, and I'm just going to sit and stare at the computer and start to try to write fiction and not 
tell anybody about it, but I'm just going to do it. And from and so once I made that job, that's probably five years ago. Um, I sat down and I said, I'm going to write because you know one of the seminal books for me is like a lot of people is Nine Stories, J.D. Salinger's Nine Stories, which you know I remember from being a kid. So I said, you know, I'm going to um, I'm going to write nine stories. And so I sat down and I wrote two or three, and I showed them to some people, and they said they're they're good. Keep going. And I wrote four or five. And then uh, and they were taking about a month each. And then the fifth one, uh, the fifth one started delving into, the fifth one started taking the form of a classic kind of classic, the, the usual form of a first novel. And so then I realized, okay, this is a first novel. And, and you know, you sort of realized early, you know, it got up to 10, 20,000, 30,000 words. And I realized, like, okay, this has a different arc than, than the short story thing, right? Which is, the, the short story is a slice of, like Chekhov said, like, short story is something you see out of the corner of your eye. You know, so short story is, is usually about a moment in time, a decision, an event you see over here, people muddling through life, you know, that kind of thing. And so, anyway, well, that, the, this piece I, I started realizing was very autobiographical and more of a novel. So I finished that up and started the, trying to get started, the trying to get published sort of circus and then kept writing short stories in the meantime while I was trying to get published. And once the novel, once I just, once I decided to, uh, to, um, to sort of give up on, to, I went through a couple editors, worked with me, and I got close at a couple places, but the novel didn't get through, and I decided to put it in the drawer and uh, finish a short story collection. How long did it take you? Everybody always asks me that. How long did it take you? I, I think beginning to end, probably five years, you know? I mean, so my friend Jim Gavin says it takes a, it takes, what does he say? It takes um, morbid dedication to write a collection of short stories. <laughs> um, but it was, it was uh, you know, I wrote a novel in between. But, I wrote, you know, I probably wrote, I think the closest thing, it probably isn't, I haven't done this, but I have a lot of friends who have. I think the closest thing is to, like, making an album. You know, I probably have 15 stories, so like I, I think people that make albums, you know, you generally write 14, 15 songs and then call it down to 10. That's kind of what it was like, you know, and then, uh, and then I honed in and, you know, I probably had 13 or 14 stories and, and in various forms of finished and then I kind of honed in on the title and the themes and the hook and, uh, and I picked nine and, you know, I, uh, and I figured which nine would fit, and I wanted nine as an homage to, you know. I, I, I'll say this, this other, I'll go on this other tangent. My, my, one of the reasons I didn't write for 25 years, or one of the reasons I was stuck is, um, like a lot of us, I was always a reader, but making the jump over to craft, anytime I would sit down and try to do the craft, you'd hear the voices, you'd hear the influences, you'd feel all the stuff, and. You know, I remember reading the, the, the Harold Bloom book, uh, The Anxiety of Influence, when I was in college and, and just thought a lot from a sort of criticism point of view about, about the criticism level on different writers for different... See, you and, you're so unique and, and, and original that you probably never had this problem, but I, you know, I would always feel the anxiety of influence, you know, and... and, uh, I, th and I think, how many of you are writers in the room? I don't believe there's only that. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> wannabes. One, yeah. How many wannabe writers? That counts. <laughs> All right, two more. I mean, I, you talk about that. The anxiety of influence is like a real thing. You become a writer, at least I did, because I read a couple books, and I was like, wow, I want to do that. And so then you start writing, and it's, they, they affect you. And I know my, the first things I wrote were all mimics. I was just mimicking other people. And, and you can become a pretty good mimic relatively easily because there's a path for you. You're just copying. You're just putting down different words but using the same style or the same rhythm. And for me, I don't know if it's the same for you, it, it was just time. It was yeah. knowing I was mimicking, knowing that the influence was sort of dominating what I did, and believing that if I put enough time in it, I could discard the influence and hopefully become the person copied instead of the person copying. Yeah, I mean, and you, uh, you have a very origin, original, I mean, I, that, I don't mean to make short shrift of that because I'm sure it was, um, 
incredibly a lot of time passed for you to do that. But you, you, I think you naturally have a very original, very original voice. My, my, my thing was, you know, my block for 25 years, I think, had a lot to do with the anxiety of influence and feeling like I was mimicking. And it sounds like, and I think you were a little more co courageous about it younger. And what I did, decide, I, I finally became sort of desperate enough, though, to to go and get in this room. And then I just had this moment where I decided that. I love John O'Hara, I love John Altaic, I love J.D. Salinger, I love John Cheever, I love, you know, uh, Mavis Gallant, I love, you know, I love all these, John Steinbeck, I love all these writers, and you know what, Philip Roth, blah, blah, blah. I, I'm just going to invite them into the room with me, fuck it, I don't care if it sounds like that stuff, it's going to be me, and, and you know what, I, I'm stuck here scratching and clawing, I'm going to steal stuff, I'm going to steal, I'm going I'm to use whatever I can you know, he told me a great thing. He told me he keeps Frederick Exley's The Sports Writer right next to him all the time. I never forget, you probably don't even remember telling me that, but I remember you telling me that, and I was thinking, that's it, you know, like, and I picked some books that I just had with me, and so the big triggers for me after, like, the, whatever, the gates flowing after 25 years were stuff like that, like, actually saying, oh, okay, I'm, I'm, um, doesn't matter what I think reading-wise anymore. I gotta actually write this thing, and I'm gonna use whatever tools I have, and then, so for me, my writing comes out a lot. There's a lot of, I, and then I play with it. So my, my stuff has a lot of um, intertextual stuff hidden in plain sight. That's a stupid fancy word, but I mean, I, I play with up like stuff. I play with a lot of John O'Hara stories. I play with, like the first story is called Summer Farmer. Summer Farmer is the name of a short, The Summer Farmer is the name of a short story that John Cheever wrote in 1952. Um, it's, in that, it's in the great big red book of his stories. And so, you know, I read, and anybody writing short stories, right, should read, just read, you can do worse than just reading John Cheever all the time, right? So, um, you know, I read that story, and, and, and the next to last paragraph of that story, The Summer Farmer, had a, is a 140-word sentence, just one sentence. And I just said, wow, I mean, this is like, this is like the level that I was at when I was trying to, so I, I said, wow, can I, I wonder if I could write a sentence like that. And so I started playing around with writing a sentence, and I copied the, the way, you know, he did it, blah, 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 exclam um, blah, 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 you know, colon, and then list with semicolons in between, you know, like phrases with semicolon, you know, and I, so I, I did that, and then I thought, okay, well, wouldn't it be cool to use that sentence as the middle part of a story and make a story like an accordion, so, and then I came up with the idea of a guy starting in Malibu um, and driving to Century City, which is 27.6 miles or something like that, to Century City, the drive I make every day. And then meeting some other guy using the connecting sentence from Cheever, and then having the guy that he meets ride 27.6 miles to Glendale. And then there's sort of 13 paragraphs coming in and 13 paragraphs going out. And so I have them all be commensurate. So the first paragraph is, is about the same thing that the last paragraph's about. And the second, you know, it's like their daughters, drugs, you know, Starbucks. The Dodgers, you know, they, they think about Dodgers Angels, you know, they think about or go through different things all the way in and out. Like, one, one thing every writer does, whether they're like did it or not, is we play these games and we imagine that someday somebody's going to give a shit about it. <laughs> to listen to it? To very carefully read everything we write, figure it out. Oh, they got that from there. Oh, they got that from there. And if you're a writer and you don't say that, if you do that, you're full of shit. <laughs> we all do. <laughs> Um, so how did you arrive at this book? Tell us about this book, what, it, what, what, it, what the stories are, what the, the themes are, if, if there are. Sure, so I mean, I'll give two seconds about, so, so after my experience with the novel and, you know, and I was, it was sort of some doctor's worst patient stuff. I wasn't having much luck with the publishing industry, even though I'm supposedly this sort of big entertainment lawyer. So I, um, I kind of just collapsed in on myself and I, and I kind of wrestled with, I, I, I thought of it and was told that a short story book would be virtually impossible to, to publish. So I sent some stories out to some agents and I got one response that said, you know, no offense, but these are just white man's problems. <laughs> and so, so it's my actual experience. So I, I um, you know, so I felt sore, you know, and I felt sorry for myself for about a month. And then I said, you know what, that's right. That's right. That's what I write. That's, that's, what, that's what's coming out so far. That's what it is so far. And you know what? It's probably that. And so that, that galvanized the idea. And then I think the second 
thing is, and then I said, I'm just not going to wait for him. I'm not going to send this to publishing. I'm not going to go through that anymore because I'm 50. I, you know, I don't have time to wait. I want to make something. I want to see a book. I want to actually make a book. And I don't, and you know, in that, you know, I think the stigma of self-publishing versus the, the, the availability of it and the ease of it are, are going like that. And I think it's becoming less stigmatized every day. And I think it's becoming easier every day. And those sort of are, are pressures that are, you know, and that's a good thing. So I, I didn't tell anybody. I just went and went on Amazon's self-publishing platform. And then you go on a journey. And it's a really interesting journey. And I had a manuscript. And I won't get into that journey. But it, it's, I, I'm all for it, man. I, it, was, it was really interesting to me. And there's a... Well, the, the irony is once you self-publish the book, you've got to still right. publish it. Yeah. So then what happened is, and then I, you know, and I, I met some great people. And I put the book together. And you make the cover. And you make the interior design. And you edit it. And... You do all that stuff, and it yields a book, and it goes up on Amazon. And then, because of being the ego-driven maniac that I am, I had a couple parties for myself, um, <laughs> announcing it. And then, uh, and 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 my friends Didi and James hosted one. And then, um, you know, and then and then uh, a, a great editor, Mor Morgan Entrekin, came to the New York party, and he said, "Give it to me." And he called me a couple days later. And he said, D "You know, I'm not saying this because I'm friends with your friends. This is good." He said, come on in and talk. And so, and so this has been published by Grove. He picked it up and did a deal for me to write a novel, so, um, which I'm working on now. So, um, so that's the story of the book and the, sell, the sort of side story of self-publishing, which I like to tell because, um, you know, I, I, have nice, I, have, I don't have anything bad to say about the self-publishing world or the publishing world. They're, you know, I think they're all... You know, God bless everyone. Um, and, and for those of you in the room who are writers or wannabe writers, or if you, yeah, first thing I would say is if you call yourself a wannabe writer, stop and call yourself a writer. Because if you don't call yourself a writer, you're never going to be one. But the other thing is like, there's a million ways and a million paths to finding publishing. And, and whether you do it yourself, whether Man Police does it, it's the same thing shouldn't judge the quality of your own work <coughs> based on that. You should judge the quality of your work based on what it makes you feel when you write it and when you read it. And, and there are a million stories. You know, my first book, my wife sitting in the back, got turned down by 17 publishers before it found a home and then it sold 12 million copies. Um, you know, Kevin found his way to Grove, which has a special place in my heart because they published Henry Miller. Um, by publishing his own book. So if you're a writer, you know, do whatever you feel is true to yourself and, and you'll find a way. And finish. The thing I say is finish. The, the, the thing I think you got to do is finish something. Finish something, even if you don't show it to anybody. The, the, the thing we all get stuck doing too much is not finishing. Um, Self-editing is a trap. Yeah. F finish. And so then the the... You know, so then I got the hook of White Man's Problems, and then I found my, and basically what I wanted to do was write, uh, these are nine stories about nine men, nine white men, in the different, along the matrix of life, in different stages of life. And it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit sub subversive to call, have called it White Man's Problems. It is not a political track. I do not, I do not I'm not here to, you know, make a case for the, terrible state of white men's rights in America. I, you know, that, that, that is not the point of the book. But, um, you know, the, the title story is sort of about a guy, you know, I think the, the colloquialism, white man's problems, you know, is, has, has, been, has arisen in the culture as, as humorous. When, when you look on the internet, there's funny stuff about white, you know, there's stuff like Saturday Night Live and Louis C.K. and stuff like that. And so it's a funny thing, and it connotes frivolous, not you know, important problems. And I think, you know, and that's fair and funny and cool. But I also think it's, you know, I think it's probably a pretty more, it's a more versatile colloquialism than that. And it can be, it can apply to a lot. It's kind of an interesting thing to contemplate, you know, and. Um, I also, though, I think it's appropriate because it harkens back to what we talked about, between Cheever and Updike and O'Hara and Raymond Carver, they wrote stories about white guy problems. And that sort of genre, which sort of dominated American literature for 75 years, sort of has fallen out of favor. And the thing I loved about the book, 
in the stories when I read it was it sort of was an homage to them and clearly influenced by them, but also a very contemporary take on it. And, and it's something I miss. I miss that kind of writing. It's powerful and it's, it has guts and it, and it, and it has weight. And, and I think that's the beauty of the book. Well, that, that, that certainly was the... Thank you. That, that's exactly the idea. I mean, I, I, I don't think those guys necessarily could have called or would have called their books White Man's Problems, but I kind of thought, like, if the sundial had moved forward, kind of where are we? And, um... I mean, Rabbit Run is a, book, is a whole series of books about white guy problems. Yeah, exactly. And, and everything John O'Hara ever wrote is about white men's You know, and, and, you know, it's great that... Ever, it's amazing that all, all the other voices and the, 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 the scale of voices and everything, whatever the word is, has expanded. It's just, um... You know, this is what I this is what I wanted to write, and then when I received that feedback a little bit, then I kind of got a little kind of got a little pugilistic about it, you know. But but um um. You want to read? Yeah, I'll read. I'll read one but because it, it, it's uh I'll read one real quick. It, it's it's um. What did I want to say? Um, well, I'll I'll, I'll get. But it, it, it's it's the book is nine stories about nine guys in the different parts of the life cycle. They're not all rich, although some of them are wealthy, and I think the problems of the one percent are. Or a germane thing and a and a thing worthy of ex examination, um, you know, just as uh, you know, for better for worse and for whatever conclusions you draw and, um, you know. But I'll read a quick one from the middle story of uh, called Mulligan's Travels. I'll just read a couple quick paragraphs. Jim Mulligan's because th this is, I guess, as many as as much as any of the stories uh, uh, emblematic, right? Right, Dee Dee. Jim Mulligan, Mulligan's Travels. Jim Mulligan stood in boxers and a t-shirt in the refrigerator light, beer bottle in hand, in the same spot as countless American men before and since, at once living the whiteness and watching it, a picture within a picture, hoping for a miracle snack. He was somewhat medicated, overtired, and experiencing the conflation of his three or more of his three more or less permanent worries: work, money, and what to eat. Nothing moved him. Mulligan had learned to accept such times of doubt and pain, but at the moment he was caught up in something else, something careless he had done. When he had walked into his house in Brentwood two hours before at midnight, he realized he had left a brand new shirt in the hotel room in New York. The laps aided him. He loved that goddamn thing with its small logo of intertwined dollar signs in distressed ink on the back collar. It was roomy and chocolate colored and made from thermal underwear material. A cool shirt from a cool store, the kind of effortly his, hip clothing it was so hard to find. At 50, with an undefeatable gut, he faced the attendant problem of finding clothes that struck the right balance between old and young, thick and thin. He went to the bed where Rita was sleeping with their daughter Isabella and their snoring English bulldog Henry. There was no room for three humans plus Henry, so he carried the big, dumb, lovable, brown and white brindled dog into Bella's room. The task was growing increasingly difficult. When Mulligan returned and climbed under the covers, he noticed that even, extra even after extracting old 90-pound King Henry, neither wife nor daughter woke up. He wished one of the girls had at least opened one eye and asked God, what time is it? And comforted by his arrival, fallen back to sleep. But they didn't stir, leaving him in his own company to return to his troubles. The Mexicob deal, which involved buying 10,000 new automated teller machines and supporting enterprise software, and data storage infrastructure from the, for the Mexico-based operations of his client, HNBC bearing Bloodworth, should not have been so complicated. It should have been like calisthenics. Mulligan's career had tracked the rise of the cash machine. He realized very early, it didn't take a rocket scientist, that the ATM was the future of money. And he ascended smoothly through the ranks of his first job at Harriman Hartman as an investment banker or advisor for transactions between the manufacturing companies that made ATMs and the commercial banks, otherwise known as regular banks, which in the past 20 years had deployed the machines in every branch and on every street corner in America. While Rita quit practicing law and reinvented herself as a mom and private sector productivity consultant who worked from home, he worked like a fire ant, spending all-nighters with bankers from Drexel and missing Bella's fall graduations and most softball games. He earned promotions, played golf, had season's tickets, went to lunch, went to Vegas, went to New York, went to Hawaii, and got Bella into Harvard Wrestling.
and it goes on a little later and it gets into some technology stuff. The problem these days was not all the new technology. New technology in and of itself was great. He had made a fortune from it. Nor was the problem too much technology. The pundits who opined about the negative effects of information overload, of overconnectedness, and too much choice, of a society being entertained and digitized to death did not have it quite right. The thing that was killing people, the problem, was that the shit did not work. Nothing ever worked. Everywhere, promised connections were not being made, and the humans who had, brought, who had bought a solution were left trying to solve a problem. Taken with the diminishing nature of a finite lifetime, choices became more important, multiplying daily, requiring constant double downs of the just to break even variety until there were no choices, until there were no choices left. So he muddles about his day and then he, um, and then this happens to him. With all the confusion over his remote technology, he was late for lunch. The girls wanted him at Roasty on San Vicente at a quarter past noon and he was already more than 15 minutes late. He closed his eyes in frustration. When would he break through his preoccupation with work? He'd been in New York for a week, hadn't spoken to his wife or daughter in three days, and was a no-show at yet another event that would, have, would never come again. It didn't matter that yesterday's party was billed as just another entirely missable school thing. It had turned out to yield a golden moment, a parent's keepsake to be clutched when looking back, when inevitably he would think, man, did that go fast. It was a memory, like so many others, that he would now have to access through the prism of his wife. He looked at his Blackberry. Not wanting to let the girls down, he texted Rita, I'm coming, I will be there, sorry. Mulligan went to the closet and put on the jeans, blue t-shirt, and sneakers. In moments like this, no answer from Rita was bad news, her way of leaving him alone to feel rotten about himself. He raced to the other side of the house and jumped in the car, hitting the button to open the closest of the doors of the four-door garage. His moves combined the precision that comes with having done something a thousand times with the kind of corner cutting you did only when you were in a rush like not snapping in your seatbelt, which, which he could get to once he backed out of the Kenter Canyon driveway. The car's roof narrowly passed underneath the still upward moving garage door. He reached for his sunglasses with his right hand and began rolling the wheel counterclockwise with his left. Before he get the glasses to his face, Mulligan heard a muscular and garbled noise, almost like the workings of a trash compactor. He slammed the brakes. The sound had been strange, like something being rolled very low and dense. He sat silent, hoping the coast was clear. He hoped it might have come from across the street. Maybe the gardeners were mulching something, or maybe he had run over a branch or Bella's skateboard or something. He shifted back into drive and started forward. The same low noise shot out, this time punctuated by a higher-pitched yelp. He closed his eyes and lifted his hands off the steering wheel as though it were suddenly 10,000 degrees. He had run over something. It was bad, muffled, crunching, and violent. He knew it was the sound of a body getting hit. He threw open the door and dove to the ground. There was Henry, wedged under the rear, ax rear axle, staring at him, a purplish mark on his brindled brow. Henry. So that's the, middle, that's the middle story of the book in the middle of, uh, in the, middle of the thing. And, you know, Henry's a, that is my bulldog, and Henry's a symbol. If you don't know whether he's, He's a man in midlife. You don't know whether he's coming at you or just waiting to get run over. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> I know you all have questions. Yeah. When you wrote this book and these stories, did you know that you were going to write? Like, did you go at it writing little story, shorter stories, or were they, were they, I don't know how to articulate what I'm trying to say. Were they ideas that you didn't want to develop into a longer story? No, I mean, I think I, I love the short story, like, like a lot of us. I love it, and I think, you know, it becomes such second nature to know the rhythm of a, to know the rhythm and length and kind of uh, uh, specialities of a short story. The, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? The features of a short story, you know, you, you just sort of know, you know the arc of it. Inherently, just inside, you know the arc of a novel, you know the sweeping arc of characters and the length of time you can stay with a novel and the sort of luxurious bath of a novel. In a short story, you know that it's about a decision, you know that it's about, you know that it's about a slice of life, you know that it's about people muddling through. A lot of times it's just quiet desperation. So, I don't know, I, ha I, did, have a lot, I did have a reader's inherent knowledge of the, of the form, and I really like, really like the form. And then, 
and then I think I plugged into that a lifetime worth of um, ideas, you know, and and cheat, cheat where I can, you know, like I, I applied geometric, uh, you know, I applied the geometric thing to the first one, and uh, there's a story, there's a deep, there's a very sort of Irish Catholic, blue collar Irish Catholic story in it, and uh, you know, the novena, I don't know if there's any Catholics out here, but the novena is a nine part prayer, and so I made nine parts, you know, stuff like that, but I knew those were all uh, short stories, and they came from different parts of my memory and different parts of my experience. I've been, you know, I've been fortunate to be in a lot of different, you know, I come from a blue collar, uh, hard hat environment in Philadelphia, and, um, you know, and several of the stories are, are about from that time and place, and some stories are from New York City, and some stories are from Hollywood, you know. Um, well, I thought it was interesting, if I, if I understood you correctly, that kind of in the middle, <coughs> you written three or four of these, then you wrote a novel. You yeah. Know, the, the full length yeah. novel, and then you came back and wrote a few more. And yeah, and it all kind of gets jumbled up on there because then you do, I do different drafts of the novel, but I snuck a couple stories in. But then, you know, there was a point about two years ago where I decided that, you know, chuck the novel and I'm going to, and I focused down on, I had five stories sort of in, in, in fits, in various laying around, you know, and I said, right, I'm going to, I'm going to hunker down and finish these fuckers, <laughs> you know, and, 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 and then my idea was to send them around, then I got the famous rejection, and then my idea was to, to, to make, to make, to make a book, you know, there's just, it's almost like an arts and crafts thing, you know, I'm going to make a book, you know, and, and I tell you, I think that's the best thing I could ever do, because now I watch <laughs> publishers and their art departments and all that stuff, and like, you have a little bit of a, you know, you, you know something about it, you know, and it was very creative. I always give my publishers the cover. They hear us the cover, we're not going to let you do it. And, Life and this was really cool. This is like the little gifts that you get. This was really cool. Um, my friend Karen Green is an amazing artist, and so I didn't like any of the ideas <coughs> that Amazon, you know, the Amazon thing, bless their hearts, they're, you know, is in Charleston, South Carolina. Everybody says big bad. The Create Space thing, which is the self publishing thing of Amazon, is a little company in Charleston, South Carolina. You talk to kids from, who are in college in Charleston, you know, like, like design majors who try, you know, they try covers and they send them to you. And so I didn't like anything they did, but my friend Karen, I said, I just wanted, a, I just said, I just wanted a picture of Henry with big block letters. So I took a picture of Henry with my, with my iPhone and I sent it to Karen, and she's so talented, she, Two days later, I got a FedEx of this watercolor, and I just popped it on. So there are little gifts like that, you know, man. Like that's like a that's like a gift, you know. Yeah. That's like a cool, cool thing. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. <clears throat> Was there a reason you picked the uh, title of the book for the last story? And secondly, um, I thought Carolee was going to have a boy, and yet it was Scarlet Lee on the Christmas card. Yeah, that's so. That one's for that one's for you to decide what you what you what you want to make about it. Something about miracle worker, maybe, and and yeah. uh, the predictability of life, and and all that. Um, uh, th then, um, in terms of the the, the 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 title for the last story, the the, the last story, which I love, the last story was was um, you know John Updike. John Updike had this great ability. I mean, he had this great ability to do everything, right? But John Updike had this great ability to write unlikable characters and write unlikable protagonists that were loosely based on himself. So he, he was always, for all the arrogance and all this whatever <coughs> bullshit that contemporary people try to put on John Updike, which I find offensive because I think he's the greatest, you know, artist of the 20th century, basically. But he, you know, he all the time would write stories based on himself and he would make the character, the main character, a son of a bitch, you know. And so he had this one guy named Jeff Fanshawe, who's famously in like three stories. And so I thought, how fun would it be to try to write a, a guy who's a jerk, you know, who's just a jerk. And um, so I called him Doug Hanshaw, you know, in homage, I called him Doug Hansaw. And um, that's what I started out with. And then I had gone on a school trip. It's about a guy who goes on a school trip with his, with his kids. And he's, he's, an, he's, a, he's a reluctant chaperone on a trip to DC. And he's, He's like a he's a jackass, you know, and and um and he and he he's just a jackass, and he and it's all the things he gets into, um, you know, on the trip, and you know, it, it's sort of a matter, you know, that's the being a chaperone is the most responsible thing, and he's terribly irresponsible and all that stuff. So that's like that was just 
a lot of fun. And he, you know, he's the most, he's the most victimized of, of, the, of the characters, you know. So he, I thought he was, to the extent white man's problems is a, is a, is a funny thing, I thought he was the best, most fitting for a humorous treatment because some white man's problems are ridiculous. And white man's problems, you know, are, are threaded all in and out of light. Like Mulligan has a, a lot of problems. You know, he starts off thinking, you know, being upset about his shirt. That's not a big problem. You know, that's a white man's problem. But then he runs over his dog. So, you know, like he gets, and he has these technological problems. And all that. So anyway, so the last story um, I saved for the, for the, for the sort of humorous thing. And, you know, and, and that is a, that is a, you know, that is a, a, a great sort of tradition of people writing about the suburbs, you know, and the white man in the suburbs. It's something like Donald Barthel, I, I stole a quote from Donald Barthelme at the beginning of the book, which says, you know, who was an amazing writer, who said, uh, Donald Barthelme said about life, there's nothing to do but go home and drink your nine drinks and forget about it, you know. <laughs> so it's like that, that kind of, that kind of thing. Yes, sir. Uh, what drew you to golf? And uh, was there any updike influence there? Um, golf? Like playing golf. Uh, what drew you to the sport? I mentioned the golf tournament. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> you know, I, metaphorically, I think it's, I, I think it's a great, it's a great, uh, like I said, you're always looking for, you're always looking for these um, uh, setups and stuff, right? You're always looking for uh, vehicles and angles and ways in to treat, to treat subject matter. So a golf game or a golf course or guys playing golf, is a great is a great setting for a story. Is a great world uh, to put a, 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 a story in. And then our golf tournament that, that he's talking about was sort of a joke. None of us are any good golfers, so it was kind of a way a joke of a way of giving people a day off to go out and attack the golf course. A lot of people that you know who wouldn't be let out on a golf course like him at the time. Um, <laughs> It was it was uh that, that kind of jokey thing, but uh, a lot of swearing, a lot of alcohol, and a lot of balls, and, That's what that is. and a lot of wreckage of golf carts. I, I mean, you know, one, one of the things I wanted to say is, is that is that um, you know, I wanted to write, I wanted to write characters, and this gets to both. I think we share this, you know, this gets to sort of maybe our personal views on. And I'll speak for myself. My personal views on fiction currently, and and uh, literary fiction, and maybe literary fiction from our perspective. But I I I I I think there are a lot of writers and a lot of characters where where these these issues of white man's problems or these issues of internal struggle and victimization by the world that you can't voice. I think we have a lot of. I think the literature has shifted a little bit. To where maybe the male characters talk about that in their inner voice more directly, you know, and kind of whine a little bit. There's a little bit of whining in, in literature, I think, you know, from the male characters, and and uh, and it's just sort of very neurotic, kind of heady, kind of writing. At least that's what I find a lot. That's my opinion, you know. So I, I wanted instead to write red-blooded American male characters. Very American, you know. They're unapologetically, unapologetically, unapologetically red-blooded. You know, they like they they have they have, you know they have you know uh, problems of children and divorce and sex and everything else on their mind. But the observations are from the outside. Uh, the, you know, like uh, the older man, uh, John Collier, who was in the Korean War, whose wife is suffering from Alzheimer's. He, would, for not one second, would ever think about men's rights. You know what I mean? Like, like you know, you have to write that guy from the outside, as opposed to some <laughs> contemporary guy living in Brooklyn, making artisan chocolate and thinking about the the, <laughs> the world that, that he was in. And I think we agree on that. I just think it's become unfashionable to try to. Like, I say when I write books, I want to hurt you. I want you to read what I write. And I, want it to work. I want to make you feel things. I want to, you know, I, I say it, I say fuck you up. I want to make you feel pain, and I want to make you feel fear. And and, and there's nothing ironic about it. And I think the the trend in literature over the last 20, 20 years in America has all been to irony. If you feel pain, it's a you got to make a joke about it. You can't say, I'm scared and I'm miserable.
people and I hurt, you have to say, I'm scared. Yeah. But I'm still cool. You know, and it's like at the old in the old school <coughs> you just said what you felt and I think, you know, um, that's sort of banished. And and I think absolutely and I think, you know, more specifically, what what's come out for me, you know, and I'll and I'll try to write different things as I go on. But what, what's come out for me are the sort of themes of the American dream, and the things that a male feels that maybe has to repress, in conjunction with going through the problems that are arise in the chasing of the American dream, even the finding of the American dream, you know, the, maybe the way that they, they, there's there's a couple of younger people in the book, maybe the way kids look at the upside of the American dream and the way, you know, the people, the men are of all ages, you know, and that was a great Cheever, Updike, you know, uh, Saul Bellow, that was a great thing, you know, like, like the way they dealt with the finding of the American dream and um, perhaps the inability to, to express emotions about the, the problems with it, you know, um, and so I like that stuff. I, I like the I like the I like the stuff where that 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 uh that maybe they can't they have to be a little stoic about and you know suck up, but is still really in there and has pain and you know just is meant to provoke um to provoke different provoke different thoughts. I'm kind of after that. So far, I'm after that pain. Yeah. Go ahead. this all together, uh, an experience of feeling something, discovering something more than you had anticipated in yourself? Well, it's incredibly vulnerable. It's incredibly vulnerable making, you know, um, this part, especially the part of it coming out. It's incredibly vulnerable making. It's incredibly <coughs> rewarding, you know, because I, I don't know, you get, I, and I, I, I'm convinced that a lot of people in the room have this film, but you get a little, you know, you're a good writer. You get a little, like, you're a good writer things all along your life, and I got, I got a lot of a lot of those, you know, and that actually starts to become a weight around your neck because you, you know, at least for me, I felt like I haven't been realizing that, and so it's incredibly like you know to have him save stunned, you know, that that's an incredibly rewarding thing for me and kind of validates this hope that I've had inside of me all these years, you know, and I don't know why it I don't know why it it you know I went and saw Louis Begley. Um, the, the great writer who was a lawyer for 40 years and started writing at 50. I went to, I went to see Mr. Begley, just a, a friend of a friend introduced me, and he, 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 he what he said is, he just said, uh, he, he said, not to, not to use hearsay, <laughs> to use a lawyer term, but, you know, he, he, he said, you know, the stories that he wrote when he finally sat down to write were a lot different than they would have been when he was younger, and I, th and I think that's, I think that's exactly right, and, and, you know, and even though I wasn't writing during that 25 years, I was certainly paying attention. I was watching, you know, and I was watching kind of the fits and stuff. Here, here's what I really think, not to be literarily boring, but I, I really think that, um, I really think that the people my age went through a lot of excruciating journeys um, in, the, in literature in the last 25 years. A lot of rat hole postmodern stuff, a lot of different fights with forms and stuff like that. And I think most writers I respect are returning to a classic kind of form. And I'm kind of glad I, you know, he, he sort of is in his, you know, he's completely, completely brilliantly unique and doesn't worry about these other things too much. But I think a lot of people have gone through a lot of pain and, and rat holes and have arrived back thinking that it you know, sort of a classic style of beautiful sentences, you know, um, unearthing, you know, human emotions are, are, is the way to go. And um, so to answer your question, you know, I, I the, the, you know, I was, I was, it was very rewarding to feel like I could get it out. And, um, and then other aspects of it have been very painful, like being vulnerable, getting rejected, you know, um, bad reviews, whatever. So, but if, but it, so it, you know, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of discovery, I guess, on that. Thank you for sharing. You're welcome. Um, are any of your stories going to be reprinted? I like all of them. I think you did a great job with all the characters. But man, that Mulligan was great. The guy who can't change a battery or a light bulb is all of a sudden 
Jerry reading his jab for the card to say the dog. I thought New Yorker. Is anybody anybody who picks those stories up? Um, I think it's I think well, it, it's, I think it's easy. I think you're more likely to get killed by a polar bear and a regular bear on the same day than get a published story published in the New Yorker, right? Um, um, and I think some, once something is published, uh, once something is published, I don't think they they don't, they, they don't take it. But but I'm glad you but I'm glad but thank you and I'm glad you. And I love I love that you picked up on the technological aspect of the story because I love the theme of technology and I love the theme of the the theme of like what it does to all of us and you know um, did you guys read that like that that I mean I thought it was a very long winded piece but that piece by Leon Wieseltier in the Sunday Book Review a couple of days ago just about the battle with technology and all that stuff I, that's obviously you know we live in a we live in a time of technological ascendance and you know. I think basically all of us on the humanities side are wrestling with how to fight that one way or another. And so, um, you know, the, the, the story is a great opportunity to treat that subject matter a little bit like, you know, man wrestling with technology and wrestling with what's important and not important. But I didn't even take it as the technology as much as his basic skills of oh, right. you know, the toolbox hidden away, changing a light bulb, changing a you know, nothing had to do with. Right. Software, you know? <laughs> right, and that has to, and that that I was also a way of treating like that's a manly thing, right? Like what, like a man, you're supposed to be able to change the tire, yeah. right? But then if you become this sort of super one percenter professional, you know, guy, sometimes you, for, you don't you never pick up how to change a tire. Other people change the tire for you, but if you run over your, if you run over your dog, all of a sudden you have to change the fucking tire, and like you don't know how to do it, and you know, and then is you know is your knowledge about how to put a contract together, you know, or how to put a deal together, is that transferable to how to put a jack together, are those, you know what I mean, is the technological knowledge the same as regular knowledge, and, you know, where does it all run together, and stuff like that. Did you have a question? Yeah, where did you come up with the lead character in Slipstream? Ah. I can't just, the character has to be kind of outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> That's a weird story. We're going in all different ways. In the story, a, uh, a lawyer, uh, a sort of, a uh, Beat up, a beat up lawyer, uh, sort of workaday lawyer, goes and loses a very mundane motion in court, and then uh, drives home uh, and turns himself into a homeless person and goes down to Third Street Promenade and starts yelling in Masonic term, messianic terms. Um, you know, I just thought of, I just thought of, you know, when every man's fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> when you work in, you, you know, when you when you. I don't know, you know, we all work in, or, you know, a lot of people work in office buildings, you see cubicles, you see offices, and rows and rows and rows of offices, and, you know, um, there's, a, there's a certain, you know, I, I have this certain fear of, of mountains of paper as a lawyer and just sort of, uh, just absolute sort of Kafka-esque meaninglessness of, of paper-pushing lawyer practice, and so I just thought, like, if a guy really became uncorked, like what, what would he do, you know? And and then uh, then I got off on like you know could and I was thinking about Raymond Carver a lot when I wrote that story. And now, you know, Raymond Carver stories, you can start reading them and something ridiculous can happen. And then you but then you say, wait, it was ridiculous to be you know I was, I was in the bar with the blind guy and the midget came here, and then I think that's ridiculous. I was already at this ridiculous point, so. I was thinking, you know, to, to think the end is weird, you already have to be in a pretty weird place. So I, I based that on lawyers that I see every day and just like what would happen if they really blew a gasket. Yeah. Before you started writing in earnest these last five or six years, whatever it was, when you were working and dreaming about writing, were you keeping a journal? Were you keeping notes? Would you see a moment in time and jot it down and hide it somewhere? Um, not so much, you know. I mean, I think, you know, the, 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 I think there's a very weird relationship between, I think a lot of lawyers are writers, you know, I think there's a very weird relationship between the practice of law and writing, right? In both, in both cases, you're working with documents, you're working with words, you're completing, edited, finished product, right? That's all the same. But, the, you know, and so all that is sort of, there's mutuality there. But on the other hand, it's completely horrible. To be, for being a fiction writer, because in the practice of law, you're kind of the way I like to think about it is you're trying to exterminate ambiguity, and the way I like to write, I like to create ambiguity, right? So they're almost like completely different wires, you know. So, I mean, my I think my method of staying warm is is I, you know, and maybe it's hiding 
my light under a bushel a little bit, or not trying, or not working hard enough. But I, I would write businessy things. We write long emails to each other. You know what I mean? Like, you, 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 you know, you feel it coming out in all kinds of different ways. And then, I, you know, and I started another another thing. Another thing I did is I live in a world where I see great great screenplays, great teleplays, great movies, great television shows every day, and I work around incredibly talented people who generate that stuff in a daunting fashion. You know, and I, I always kept writing fiction over here, and I n never really think about them being movies or anything, because I always just thought that would be my thing one day. And movies and television and other stuff are very, are, 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 are art forms that require a lot of consent and a lot of people. So somebody can't just go make a movie. They have to, to get the consent of a lot of people and financing and stuff like that. When you write a screenplay, it's designed to be interfered with with other people, right? So I've always just felt like fiction could be the thing that I could do um, myself my own control and all that stuff over here. So I kind of had it squirreled away and tucked away and, and um, was sort of learning what I, di I didn't, I didn't want to do, although being exposed to incredible writing for a very long time. One thing I think about that is that stuff doesn't really help. No? No. Like, <laughs> um, writing a journal and actually writing are radically different things. There's no pressure with a journal and you don't, Evan mentioned at the beginning when you sit down and you stare at a blank screen or you stare at a blank page. Um, when you're writing a journal, there's no pressure to fill it. It's almost a joy. Um, when you're doing it for presentation's sake, knowing that at some point you're going to show it to people and either publish it or try to get it published, it's a whole different game because there is pressure deal with a whole radically different set of uh, insecurities and, and questions and you know journaling isn't story writing. It's not storytelling. That's a classic fry reduction of the truth. That's that's great. That's brilliant. <laughs> Only he would say it too. You know, and, and when you're sitting down to tell a story, it's, it's a different game. That's so true. You you you're right. Anybody else? One more question. Yes, ma'am. Wendy Mulligan here. I'm not sure I'm going to let my husband read. <laughs> he might hit my dog. <laughs> On um, I loved your 140 uh, word paragraph. I had to read that twice. So it was funny that you, when you mentioned that I had to go right and walk. That was really brilliant. Um, begs the question, female authors anywhere? You mentioned every male author out there. Um, I love Mavis Gallant. I love I love more than life itself, Flannery O'Connor. She's the hippest, coolest, badass in the whole world. You know, I love Lori Moore. Um, you know, I, uh, uh, you know, I love. I, I have. I'm, I'm, I, my influences are my influences. Um, but I, you know, and I wish. Maybe I wish I had more um, uh, women writers that I could rattle off, but. Um, but they're there. They're, 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 they're definitely, they're definitely there. I just, um, you know, I think, uh, I don't know. I think there's some part of this is about being honest, you know, and, and uh, my, my, and whatever, there's something for everybody. My feeling, my, my experience so far is that women like, uh, I think, knowing what guys, what's going on in some guys' heads, you know, um, and I, you know, I, I hope, I, I hope, I want to keep writing the rest of my life, and I hope I can be broader. I'd love to inhabit a woman's uh, character's mind at, at, at some point. And, you know, and, uh, you know, and, and there's, plenty of, there's plenty of great... I don't know if you ever read Mavis Gallant, but I can almost read her exclusively. She just passed away, too. If you want to read great, beautiful, long, flowing short stories, read, read Mavis. Well, thank you, Kevin, for coming out to connect. Thank you, Jaime. library for yeah. having us. Thank you. And lastly, thank all of you for supporting this library, um, supporting Kevin, coming out, checking out his book and listening to him. And support your local bookstore. Bookstores like libraries are institutions that need our help and need to be supported. Right on. Thank you. Thanks everybody.
sing a song right now. Wait till it's close. Yes. 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 Yes.